Well, once again, that was a bit of a farce and quite frankly, I'm glad that that malarkey is now over. This isn't strictly going to be a video about the American, the US election, presidential election, but I will say one thing, there is one thing we can certainly all agree on and is that is that we all support Joe Biden for being the upholder, the preserver of the word malarkey, a fantastic word. That's a bunch of malarkey. Um, just for that reason, I think it's great to see him in office, really. The election race in the USA has always been a little bit of theatre, a real spectacle. You could even say a bit of a circus, and this time round was no exception. I'm sure the circus will continue for some time. Bits of theatre, fascinating spectacle, bit of a circus, or just a downright shit show this time round. Whatever, it's always a really interesting insight into a unique bit of democracy. As I say, this channel is more about Germany and not really about, this video is not really about the American election as such and not about Trump. But I will say one thing, I will of course offer my opinion very briefly. Many will look at Joe Biden and say, well, policy wise, what is really going to be the difference? And there is a lot of um, argument, there's a very strong argument to say that there is not that much difference between any candidate between the Democratic Party and the Republican, Republican Party. Trump was a very unique, exceptional uh, politician, to put it in polite terms. I find him absolutely intolerable. I don't really think Joe Biden is the political candidate is not the president that America needs to solve much of its um, social problems. I don't think his policies will go far enough when it comes to healthcare, um, social policies in, in general, but that's by the by. This is still a very, very important development because of rhetoric. Um, this channel, you're, if you're familiar with my channel, you know that language is very important to me. I'm very interested in language and I know the importance of language and this goes for politics as well whether or not Trump implemented certain policies that were largely different to anybody else or not, or whether Biden will make um, radical change or not. The difference was in the rhetoric. Trump used a rhetoric which was more than just populist. It was more than just dangerous. It was a rhetoric that emboldened very ugly factions of the political map all around the world. His language emboldened the far right and legitimized forms of racism and intolerance that we thought were long since dead. He was seen as an ally for the most loathsome, disgusting factions of world politics and make no mistake, with his refusal to condemn racists, condemn fascists, his, his willingness to incite hatred and promote division, it is important that he's gone. Relating this back to Germany with his, his symbolic power, his, his role as a figurehead for the far right throughout the world, he emboldened groups such as the AfD, they make no mistake, they will be very sad that this figurehead has gone and that will take a lot of wind out of their sails. I'm going to leave it there. It is a win for democracy. I think Joe Biden probably has the right conciliatory, conciliatory however that's pronounced, the um, attitude of conciliation to maybe heal some wounds. He's certainly got um, a more democratic approach to the US. So there is hope for the US and um, more importantly for the world, for a different atmosphere going forward. But as I say, this video is less about political opinion and more about political systems. And one thing that is always clear, what strikes me about the US election is here in Europe and certainly in Germany, what we are struck by, what we're astonished by sometimes is how the popular vote, i.e. the actual number of votes cast for one candidate, seemingly for one candidate versus the votes for another candidate, how that popular vote seemingly does not re reflect the final result of the election. It's astonishing, for, his, for example, for us to imagine that a candidate such as Hillary Clinton four years ago, how she could amass some 2.87 million more votes than her com uh, opponent Donald Trump at the time, and still lose the election. In what at face value seems to be a 
a piece of really direct democracy, almost referendum-like in nature. This process of choosing the President of the United States of America clearly is not, and somewhere along the line, some vo it seems that all votes are equal, but some votes are more equal than others. So I'm going to look at the political systems in Germany, the USA, and the UK to contrast and compare, in particular, the route to selecting the most important position in domestic politics. That is to say, the President of the United States of America in America, of course, in the UK, the Prime Minister, and in Germany, of course, the Bundeskanzler, or Bundeskanzlerin, as we have at the moment, the Federal Chancellor. And I want to ask the question as, well, as to whether the German system is more democratic or less democratic or equally democratic to the US system and the UK system. Spoiler alert, the German system is the most democratic. Maybe one quick distinction in advance. There is one major difference between the countries, the European countries in this, this analysis and the USA in that we have in the USA, in the president, you have the leader of the most important figure in domestic policy, but also he acts as the head of state. Whereas in the Germany, we have a Bundeskanzler, who is the most important, this is the most important post in domestic policy, but we also have a representative, a head of state, who is the Bundespräsident, the federal president. And in the UK, it is a similar situation in that we have a prime minister, who is the figurehead, the leader of domestic politics, but a separate, there is a separate head of state. A completely different system in that we have a hereditary title in the UK that is not part of any democratic process. It's a hereditary title, as I say, handed down from family member to family member and cur currently held by an elderly rich German woman named Elizabeth. <laughs> and in this video, of course, we are looking at the figure who has the main position, the main post in domestic policy. Okay then, so how is the German Chancellor, the Bundeskanzler or Bundeskanzlerin, elected. Essentially there are three phases of election of the election which are provided in order to elect a Bundeskanzler, a federal chancellor, but normally one of these phases, the first phase phases is sufficient. Ultimately the chancellor is elected based on a recommendation from the Bundespräsident, from the federal federal president. Unlike earlier constitutions, um, the Bundeskanzler is not determined by the head of state directly, but rather by the parliament, i.e. by the Bundestag. And the votes from the Abgeordnete, the members of parliament, the members of the Bundestag, the Bundespräsident then nominates the federal chancellor. This first election phase for the federal chancellor then comes into play if the post is vacant. That is to say, if there is no federal chancellor. Now, the most normal situation for this is, of course, if there has been a, a national election to elect a new a Bundestag, a new parliament. Parliament has been elected and assembled. Bundespräsident, the federal president, has been elected and he then nominates his chosen candidate for the chancellor. Now, legally speaking, the federal president has complete freedom to nominate who he wants, but politically, politically the reality is that this is um, decided based on discussions, ha um, the parliament having been formed, discussions with the faction heads and the heads of parties. So it is in, in harmony with what the members of parliament, the members of the Bundestag, the Abgeordnete have decided. As the reality in Germany is that it's often a coalition government, this is um, this follows this decision this nomination follows a round of coalition uh, negotiations so the coalition parties get together and decide who their candidate for the who essentially is going to become the next federal chancellor the nominated candidate is then put to a vote in the bundestag and needs a, a simple absolute majority from Parliament. As I say, second and third phases are provided in case this first round fails, but it's very, very unusual. I don't know of a case of when it actually has failed. The most important thing to note here is that essentially it is the MPs, the members of Parliament, Abgeordnete as they are known in Germany, the members of the Bundestag that, that actually essentially choose the Bundeskanzler, they vote for the Bundeskanzler, they vote in the candidate or vote out the candidate with a simple majority, a 
a, an absolute majority in the Bundestag and those are the representatives of the people voted for directly by the people as we, the normal voters, vote for our Abgeordnete in the general election. This parliamentary system is loosely something which the UK and Germany have in common in that the Prime Minister is ultimately elected based on parliamentary power and members of parliament. However, there are some very, very weird exceptions in the UK democracy, democracy in inverted commas, and then we have a lot of strange conventions. First of all, in the UK, there is no written constitution in as far as there is no single document. There is no Grundgesetz, no basic law, or no single document constitution with however many amendments there are, like in the USA. Yes, of course, the UK has a written constitution, but it is a series of laws which do not constitute one single document. Now, the Prime Minister in the UK is actually appointed by the monarch through the exercise of what is known as royal prerogative. The Queen, in this case, nominates her own Prime Minister and is completely free to choose. There is actually no formal legislation governing who she, who he or she, the monarch, um, chooses as a Prime Minister, who, who they appoint as a Prime Minister. However, in modern times, much of this process is informally governed by constitutional conventions. Although it pretty much amounts to a gentleman's or ladies and on gentlemen's agreement, the Queen or the monarch, whoever the monarch is, does abide by particularly one particular doc document which is the cabinet manual. In the past the monarch has indeed used simple personal preference to dismiss or elect or nominate a prime minister, but that goes back as far as 1834, that was the last time. Not too long ago, but it simply doesn't happen now. It is now the case that the monarch is simply not drawn into party politics. And the most important thing is that, linking this back to, to Germany, this, this similarity, the cabinet manual um, dictates that the prime minister holds the position by virtue of his or her ability to command a majority in parliament. The actual quote is the ability to command the confidence of the House of Commons Commons, which in turn commands the confidence of the electorate as expressed through a general election. Unlike in Germany, the Prime Minister must actually sit as a member of the House of Commons, member of the main chamber of Parliament, and it is always, almost always, the leader of the party with a majority in the House of Commons. There are, of course, exceptions to this. There are coalition uh, governments and minority governments, but Generally, in the UK, one party holds a majority. There is one member of parliament who is the leader of the party, and he is also then nominated by his party, the party that has a majority, thus the confidence of the House of Commons to be the Prime Minister. OK, then, so these two European systems may seem very similar at face value and in stark contrast to the direct but indirect election of the president in the USA. In the UK and in the in Germany we have no direct, we have no separate election election for the Prime Minister, there is no separate election for the Bundeskanzler. In America of course there are separate votes, separate elections for the president. And but although every, every voter, every citizen in the USA has the right to place their cross next to a name for a presidential candidate, it is still an indirect vote, an indirect election, in that this vote only elects the members of what is known as the Electoral College in the state, the respective state in which the citizen votes. And it is then the Electoral Colleges which have more or less votes depending on the size, roughly, of the state, the federal state, to then elect the president. A president needs a majority, the mark is a number of 270. As I say, the number of votes that an ele electoral college has is fixed and it is roughly tied to the size of the state. The margin of victory has absolutely no bearing on the number of electoral votes that a state is awarded. And we have the very current and relevant example of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania being the state which eventually sealed victory for Joe Biden. It is an important state in that it is so large that it it is granted 20 electoral votes and the margin of victory for Joe Biden in that state 
was very slim. It was one of the closest races, the one, one of the races which of course took most time to count, but ultimately it granted him 20 votes which pushed him over the line. Compared to smaller states, I think um, Georgia only has six um, electoral votes. Don't quote me on that, I'll correct myself if I've, I've got that wrong. But smaller states have le fewer electoral votes, and as I say, the number of electoral votes is fixed no matter how high the majority, how, how close the race has been. And that also goes a long way to explaining how Hi Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by so much, by almost more, more, almost three million votes more than Donald Trump nationwide, but still lost the vote on the electoral colleges. So far, so good then. It is clear to me that the US system has some real um, democratic deficits when it comes to the idea that the popular vote, the actual will of the people, how many people are in favour of voting for candidate X against candidate Y can be really, really different from, pr proportionately different from the actual result. The election in 2016, of course, where Clinton was the clear winner, was more popular with Americans as a whole, clearly by millions of votes, but still lost. But are the parliamentary systems of the UK and Germany better? Is it simply down to the fact that it's all about a parliamentary system in which essentially the members of parliament elect the leader? Or is it more than that? Is it something different? Let's compare and contrast Germany and the UK then. In Germany, when you vote for the Bundestag, when you vote for your members of parliament, you have actually two votes. You have a, a voting paper, a ballot paper, in which you vote twice. The first vote is um, voting for a direct mandate. Each party or indeed an independent candidate in your constituency nominates one person, obviously if it's the independent candidate nominates himself, but a party will nominate one person for the constituency and at the moment these, the, there are 299 constituencies, so you have one direct vote and this makes up roughly half of the Abgeordnete, of the members of the Bundestag in the end. Remember, it is the Abgeordnete, of the members of the Bundestag who eventually ultimately vote for the Chancellor. Now the second part of the ballot paper, the second vote, is in fact the most important, it carries the most weight. The second vote is awarded to a party usually, it is afforded, awarded to a, a faction. Citizens place their cross next to what is known as the Landesliste, so a list of candidates representing the federal state in which you vote. These votes are then counted nationwide, and as long as a party gets over the democratic hurdle, the 5% hurdle, they then are assigned a number of seats in the Bundestag, in the parliament, proportionately to the votes that they have received. There are different mathematical methods used to calculate this proportional representation. For instance, from 1987 to 2008, a system known as the Webster method or the Saint-Lagu method was used and then since then after there was a change in 2008 and they're simply um, they've been using a largest remainder method what's known as the largest remainder method also known as the Herr Niemeyer method. Now it's not important how these work and I'm not going to be surprising anyone to know to say that I don't know exactly I haven't really studied and I'm not a mathematician. But the important thing is here just the reality that there is a system of proportional representation. Um, you will understand what the difference is when we go on to talk about the UK, and I'll do that now. The UK employs what is known as a first-past-the-post system in electing its parliament. And we're talking about the House of Commons. There are two houses in, in UK politics, the main chamber being the House of Commons, which is roughly equivalent to the Bundestag. Now, on election day, Voters vote within their constituency, a geographical area, and they are presented with a list of candidates. Each party has one single candidate, and from each constituency, only one MP, one member of parliament, is elected. So you do not have the situation where in Germany you vote for a list, and multiple members of parliament are elected from this list, 
in accordance with the proportion of votes received, there is only one winner in each constituency. It is first past the post, that's exactly what it means. You do not need a majority. If there are three candidates or four candidates, for example, it is simply the candidate with the largest number of votes so you do not need 50%. That can, of course, often lead to the situation whereby in most areas the elected MP does not gain a majority. The majority of voters did not vote for their single MP, but this single MP is the one that will represent them in the House of Commons. Then, of course, you can have a massive majority for one candidate in one area, but it's simply only going to make for one MP. Large majority, one MP. Sound familiar? Sound a little bit familiar like the electoral colleges? No matter how many votes, no matter how big the turnout, no matter how big the majority, the number of electoral votes stays the same. The UK system also means that there tend to be two large parties. We very much have a, a two-party system. As small parties without any geographical base really find it hard to win seats. The Green Party is the biggest example I can think of that suffers mostly from this system. The Green Party only in the UK only has one MP. Um, currently the leader of the Green Party in I think the Brighton and Hove area. I'm not sure, exactly sure what the uh, constituency is called, but it's uh, Caroline Lucas. Caroline Lucas is by all means largely respected and popular and there is much acceptance of, increasing acceptance of the policies of the Green Party, but they generally stand absolutely no chance because they are not one of the f biggest two parties and only one party is going to win. The first past the post system does also lead to um, some regional peculiarities. Um, it's very favourable to nationalist parties. For example, in the in Scotland, the SNP, the Scottish National Party, they won roughly half of the votes in Scotland at the last general election, um, the general election in 2015. Sorry, but. Um, 95% of the seats in Scotland. What the first past the post system does facilitate is often you'll find that one party can form a government but these governments may only um, in effect have the support of less than 50% of the, the population. In 2005 for example 35% of the, the population voted for the Labour Party that eventually formed a government on its own, so ruling commons with a majority of more than 50% of the seats. And in 2015, the Conservative Party were only supported by 37% of the voters, but also went on to form, form their own government, not in coalition at all. As I say, it leads to a largely two-party system. It allows parties to form government on their own. To, for, to pass legislation, it, it makes for effective um, democratic processes and they can pa pass their own legislation effectively without any opposition, without without any debate to be honest um, and in theory that gives them the power to effect change but it's usually you find it's a back and forth the the Conservative Party will be voted in and they will effect certain legislation the Labour Party will come back in and seek to reverse that legislation and vice versa and pretty much lead to a status quo and a lack of new ideas. Even in G in Germany, where you even have a 5% clause, for example, to prevent minority radical parties, extremist parties from entering into the organs of, of democracy in the, the, the country, um, this system of proportional representation has allowed the emergence of alternatives. The rise of the Green Party here in Germany, for example, would have been absolutely impossible in the UK. Now, you can say what you want about the modern um, Green Party. I'm not really going to in enter into my opinion. You can um, say that they've um, pretty much become part of the elite, part of the status quo themselves. But when they were founded, they were genuinely, uh, a, a genuinely radically different alternative to the mainstream. They were able to enter into the mainstream and now of, are often governing it at various different levels and have also of course formed part of the um, federal government to, together in the last uh, red-green coalition that we had with Gerhard Schröder. So something um, which would be completely denied in the UK has been made possible 
in Germany. Germany is, of course, because of the proportional representation uh, system, it allows more parties, more participation in government, in more, more different parties in the Bundestag. And it obviously, of course, leads to the, the general situation is that there is a, a government of coalition. And you could also argue that that has its advantages in that it ensures that there is debate and there is consensus. It also encourages the status quo in that there can be no um, radical change effected, but it does one thing for me and it simply reflects the popular vote a lot m much more and is ultimately, it is ultimately more democratic in my eyes. The fact that our parliament here, the Bundestag in Germany, is made up of many parties that reflect the diversity of the political landscape and more importantly the actual popular vote. What did we vote for? It is not a wasted vote to vote for a party who's, who's perceived as being smaller. You can vote for uh, Die Linke, you can vote for FDP, even AfD, and you know that with the 5% hurdle conquered that is actually going to make a difference, it's going to make for a presence of your representatives, the people you perceive to represent you in the parliament and it's not going to be a wasted vote. So I think my conclusion is going to be yes Germany does have the better democratic system simply for the fact that the makeup of the parliament and of course we're talking about how the, the subject of the, the video is how we elect our political leaders, the president, the Bundeskanzler or the prime minister it's a, uh, ultimately, it is the parliament in, in Germany and the parliament in the UK that elects the leader and the electoral colleges in the USA that elects the president. The actual route itself is maybe just a technicality, but the for me, the main difference, whereas we have parliamentary systems in the two European examples in the UK and Germany, they the main difference for me and the thing that makes the democratic system in Germany much more fair and m much better is the existence, the reality of proportional representation. Now of course I always put this disclaimer in, people always ignore this disclaimer when I do political videos, but there is no such thing as a political, as a perfect democracy in, in poli politics. Democracy is always a compromise. That said, if we're comparing these three, how do we elect our leaders? I have to conclude, yes, Germany has the better, fairer system. As ever, I would love to hear your opinions. Feel free to comment down below. How did you um, experience the American election? What do you think it means for world politics? Also, do you agree with me that the imperfect but reasonably good um, system in Germany is the more democratic of the three? Look forward to hearing your comments and thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please do consider um, subscribing to the channel. Every now and again I do these kind of political videos. If you've not already done so, that is, and uh, leave me a thumbs up, give me a like. Um, at this point, I'd also like to thank my patrons. They support me with small donations on Patreon and get access to lots of um, exclusive content, for example, the Q&A, where I answer all your questions. If that's something you think you may be interested in, check down the link in the description. Otherwise, I will see you here on YouTube as ever. Thank you very much for watching. Macht's gut, Leute!